Okay, so thanks once again to everyone for joining. This is, of course, this is uh, today the fourth webinar in, in our series presented by Independent Jewish Voices, our spring webinar series. And we're really thrilled to have, have you with us. Today's webinar is titled The Fight Over BDS, Lessons from the South African Anti-Apartheid Movement. We have two wonderful guests uh, who are with us today who are going to be sharing their thoughts and reflections. And then, of course, we're going to be taking questions from the audience afterwards. Uh, first to introduce myself, my name is Aaron Lakoff. I'm the Communications and Media Lead with IJV Canada. And uh, a little description of today's webinar. So similar to today's BDS, that's of course Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement Against Israel, the campaign to boycott South Africa in the 70s and 80s was quite controversial. Friends of South Africa attempted to undermine the anti-apartheid movement through expensive and extensive state propaganda, persistent lobbying, and the use of infiltration and front groups. This webinar will look at uh, what these two cases have in common and offer some lessons that the BDS movement can learn from in the earlier anti-apartheid anti movements. So just to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, before we get started, um, like I said, this is part of a spring webinar series that IJV Canada has uh, put on. So our next webinar is going to be next Sunday. That's May the 3rd. It's wild that we're almost in May. You wouldn't know it necessarily by the weather in Montreal or in some other places in Canada. But anyways, uh, so next Sunday, May the 3rd, we're going to be presenting a webinar called Wet'suwet'en Strong, Resisting a Pipeline During a Pandemic. We're going to be hearing from uh, Wet'suwet'en Indigenous Frontline Land Defender, Jennifer Wickham, uh, who's going to be talking about the amazing uprising that we saw all across Canada in February uh, with the Wet'suwet'en Nation out in uh, so-called British Columbia, resisting a pipeline out there. Um, and then she's also going to be talking about what's been happening recently with regards to that struggle against the pipeline during the pandemic. So if you want to register for that webinar, you can go to ijvcanada.org slash spring webinars and you'll find the link to register there. I'll also be posting these links uh, in the chat. So it'd be really simple during this webinar to, uh, to log on to those and find those. Of course, all of these webinars that we're presenting are free um, and we're really happy and pleased to be uh, offering them for free, but they are not free to uh, produce or to bring to you. So if you are able, we know that these are hard times for many people financially, but if you are able, we really do appreciate donations for these webinars. They, they help us to continue to bring you these kinds of wonderful events. And so to donate to IJV, you can simply go to our website, which again is ijvcanada.org. And then you'll see at the top right of the page, uh, there's a green donate button. So you can go there and donate any amount that you want. And again, I'll post a link to that uh, in, in the chat as well. In terms of today's format for the webinar, um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers momentarily, and you'll be hearing from them for about a half an hour. Uh, and then after that, there'll be a Q&A session where um, you all as audience members can interact with us. And there's two ways to ask questions. So, so the first way to do that is there is a, a raise hand function. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see raise hand. Similar to being in a classroom in an auditorium, you'll raise your hand. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll get to your question and it, uh, I'll unmute your mic. So you'll be able to ask your question on mic and the panelists will be able to hear. I would ask that everyone keep their questions brief, make sure there's actually a question in them. Uh, and then if you don't wanna go on mic, that's not a problem at all. There's also a Q&A box which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So you can type out your question as text and then I'll read that question to our panelists. I hope that's pretty clear. I'll come back to it at the end just in case, but now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. So Dr. Michael Buchert recently completed a PhD in sociology with a specialization in political economy from Carleton University in Ottawa. His dissertation investigated the Canadian backlash to the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns against both South Africa and Israel. This research involved travel to both countries, including spending time in the archives of the African National Congress at the University of Fort Hare in South Africa. 
He's published journal articles in Radical History Review and Studies in Political Economy, and has written for popular publications, including Africa as a Country, Jacobin, and Briarpatch. His research into far-right movements, as well as Israeli online propaganda campaigns, has been cited by the Washington Post, BuzzFeed News, CBC Ottawa, the South African Broadcast Corporation, Electronic Intifada, and Mondo Weiss. He's been involved in the student movement, serving as the president of the Carleton University Graduate Students Association, the Ontario Graduate Chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario, and is representative on the Carleton University Board of Governors. He's from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, currently living in Ottawa, Ontario. And you can find him on Twitter at mbukert, uh, but I'll, I'll maybe post that in the chat. It'll be a little bit easier. He's a great follow. And for our introductory remarks, it is my great pleasure to introduce Joanne Nyman, who's joining us from Vancouver today. So Joanne is going to offer up a uh, a few uh, intro remarks first before we get into Michael's presentation. And Joanne Nyman is, of course, with our Vancouver chapter of Independent Jewish Voices. She's a professor emerita in sociology from Ryerson University in Toronto, where she taught for 33 years and is the author of How Societies Work. Her political activism began in the late 1970s when she first got involved in the anti-apartheid movement and became the chair of Canadians Concerned About South Africa. She co-authored Relations Between Canada and South Africa, a paper presented at the UN Center Against Apartheid's North, America, North American Regional Conference for Action Against Apartheid, uh, presented at the UN headquarters in 1984. And she's been an active member of Independent Jewish Voices since moving to Vancouver in 2006. So thank you both so much for being here today. And Joanne, I'll turn it over to you first. Okay, hmm. where do I start? Well, I think I'm gonna start with the very simple point that um, and my husband would kind of make fun of me for this. I'm, I tend to be a bit of a negative thinker. I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement, the original one in the 70s through a colleague of mine at work. I wasn't political at the time. And frankly, I actually never thought apartheid was going to end. I thought, oh, well, we'll just kind of carry this out and we'll do it, but you know, we'll be nice to the South African people and blah, blah, blah. So um, uh, it was a really steep learning curve for me, learning about what was going on in South Africa. And um, of course, we were considered outliers at my organization, Canadians Concerned About Southern Africa, because we were supporters of the African National Congress, the ANC, which at the time was considered a communist uh, front organization, or a communist, or you know, full of commies, which it was at the time. Uh, there were many in there, many were not. Um, and I had to learn all the ins and outs. We had fights, uh, unfortunately, even in Toronto with different groups that supported the different movements. Um, that was a steep learning curve for me. Um, but uh, the bottom line was um, realizing that we all had to come together to fight the Canadian government, which um, verbally claimed that it supported South Africa, uh, pardon me, verbally claimed it supported the anti-apartheid movement, but in real economic terms, economically was uh, supporting the, the businesses, uh, Canadian businesses in, in Southern Africa. And um, uh, in 1984, we ended up presenting at the UN. And I just want to read one sentence in the piece that we uh, wrote for this event. However, Canada was quite prepared to support general resolutions calling for the end of racial discrimination. Canada argued at the time, and indeed has continued to argue, that South Africa would more likely be influenced to change its racial policies through quiet diplomatic approaches rather than international pressure. Sounds a bit familiar. Um, so we were considered quite radical. We knew we were being chased uh, or being watched by the RCMP. Um, later, uh, we, we subsequently found out that they had five volumes of us on file of our, of our organization. And one of our members actually got a, mem a knock on her door from an RCMP agent one day, uh, not RCMP officer in uniform. 
So um, I guess the bottom line, I won't go on and give too much detail um, because Michael's going to do that and he's going to do a great job. I've read his work and it's great. Uh, just to say uh, the old saying, the struggle continues and uh, we never know how these things are going to end. And um, I'm very optimistic that we will see um, some justice for the Palestinians, but we have to be struggling at it. We can't stop. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Joanne. Again, that was Joanne Nyman, who is with our Vancouver chapter of Independent Jewish Voices. And I'm going to turn it over now to Michael Buchert. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron and Joanne. Uh, very excited to be here today and to discuss some of the things that I've been uh, writing about and thinking about for a few years. Uh, so it really is an excellent um, opportunity. I did want to talk about the struggle over BDS in a historical perspective in relation to the anti-apartheid movement. I think especially we're talking about 26 years since the end of apartheid and there's a funny thing that happened when apartheid ended, even when Mandela was released from prison in 1990, is that all of a sudden everyone was on the same side, everyone was a fan of Nelson Mandela, everyone had been against apartheid, but it's really not true. Uh, but this, uh, the, the history is that the boycott was actually quite controversial, uh, and yet that part of history gets erased, I think, from, from historical memory. Uh, and in fact, not only was the boycott controversial, but many people put concentrated efforts into trying to stop it. So for my talk, I thought I'd give sort of a big picture overview about the opposition to the South African boycott. And then perhaps we can get into some more specifics, uh, depending on what people are interested in. So like the backlash to the BDS movement today, there was an intense reactionary campaign against the South African boycott led by the South African government and by its supporters in Canada. So the South African government led an international propaganda war against the anti-apartheid movement. In the 1960s, this was mostly uh, propaganda. The government through the Department of Information had, uh, it was, well, it was producing glossy magazines, it was producing radio programs and all sorts of, uh, of propaganda that it distributed around the world. Then in the 1970s and 80s, these efforts became more aggressive and even criminal. South Africa led a covert propaganda war that was funded by slush funds and uh, money laundering. Um, and uh, it, what it did is it went around the world, it created newspapers, it uh, was creating front organizations, especially in Europe and the US, and they were targeting the offices of the ANC with burglary and in some cases even assassinating ANC members. So in Paris in 1988, they murdered uh, Dulce September, uh, ANC representative there. Um, South African government officials justified this secret war by appealing to the threat of so-called total onslaught, or the idea that South Africa faced existential threats and therefore the country had to take on controversial methods in order to defend itself. Um, and this is somewhat similar to the idea of delegitimization, which we hear discussed in relation to Israel today. Uh, I think it's important to remember that Canadians played a role in this reactionary campaign. There were elitist lobbying groups like the Canadian South African Society, which uh, was uh, an organization that sought to network with influential people and to bring them on side to get them against uh, boycotts and the call for sanctions. So this society was led by high profile members of the corporate and business elite and political elite, including corporate executives, a Quebec Superior Court judge, university professors, church leaders, and even a former liberal cabinet minister who at the time was married to the governor general uh, of Canada. So it was quite, quite an elitist organization with a significant connection to people in uh, positions of power. Um, and so their work was a lot of lobbying, a lot of education, writing letters to the editor. They provided materials to the McGill Board of Governors to help them counter the, the calls for divestment on campus. Uh, and a number of different initiatives like that. There was also an aggressive South African embassy, uh, especially in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, and especially in 1985, when Ambassador Glenn Babb arrived and he started doing these speaking tours across the country, trying to convince the public that they were being misinformed about South Africa. Um, I actually wanted to show a, a picture, if I can make this work, of, uh, this should be an image of uh, Glenn Babb, given this huge uh, 
interview profile in the Ottawa Citizen at the time, uh, given the chance to tell his story, the, the South African government's side of the story. And this was pretty typical. The uh, Glenn Babb was given space in, uh, across the country in newspapers, on the radio, all sorts of venues, even hosted by student debate clubs, uh, by rotary clubs, all sorts of civil society organizations um, giving a platform uh, to, hear, to hear what the official apartheid perspective was. And then in the late 1980s, the embassy uh, ran a, nation, a nationwide front network um, of these Friends of South Africa type organizations that it established. Um, they recruited local volunteers uh, and these organizations were intended to appear independent, but they were financed and run by the embassy in Ottawa. So each chapter of, the, of, these, of this front network would have a fax machine in someone's house and they would receive instructions almost every day from the embassy for various tasks for them to, uh, to complete. So a typical uh, task might be to receive instructions that they should write a letter to the editor because the local newspaper had printed an article that wasn't favorable to South Africa or something along those lines. And then later some members were uh, tasked to infiltrate anti-apartheid groups and to gather information on behalf of the embassy. And here again, I wanna show just an image. This is a screen cap from uh, a fifth estate documentary by the CBC in 1989 that exposed the story. Uh, this is two uh, University of Manitoba graduate students uh, coming to the CBC to tell their story of how they were approached. They were recruited by the embassy to operate the Winnipeg uh, Friends of South Africa Society or whatever it was. Um, and then they were tasked of infiltrating local anti-apartheid organizations. And eventually they decided to go to CSIS. So they became double agents and then eventually came to the CBC. But this was for a couple of years, at least, uh, a nationwide operation to uh, pretend to be a grassroots movement when it was uh, directly from the state. So support from Africa, uh, South Africa also came from far right groups, elements within the progressive conservative and reform parties and from conservative media like the Toronto Sun um, and big publishers like Conrad Black and Peter Worthington, for example, were very uh, high profile advocates uh, for South Africa during the time. So for the most part, after the 1970s, these groups were not really willing to defend apartheid itself, which was clearly immoral and uh, pretty difficult to defend. So instead, the dominant energy of all of these different groups went into campaigns to demonize the African National Congress uh, and other liberation movements as communists and as terrorists. Uh, as well as to, pro to promote the idea of reform over revolution or the idea that ongoing economic and diplomatic cooperation with South Africa was the best way to bring about peaceful change in the country. Uh, and I just want to highlight some of the common complaints that were often heard uh, made by supporters of South Africa as they might actually sound somewhat familiar. So they would argue that South Africa was being singled out for condemnation, especially from the United Nations, and, and being held to double standards while worse regimes were getting a pass, usually pointing to the Soviet Union. Um, they'd argue that inflammatory language about South Africa was being used, and this was undermining the possibility of informed and rational debate about South Africa. So again, I want to show a couple of images. Here is the cover of a magazine from 1986, I believe, um, a special edition of this conservative magazine. Um, the, the theme is South Africa Nation on Trial. Is it a black-white conflict? Uh, and this is a magazine that was distributed to all members of parliament by an outside group. So, and then there was one more image I wanted to show. Here is, um, a big article in the Globe and Mail, uh, again from 1986, The Good Side of White South Africa um, by Kenneth Walker, who had just recently visited the country as part of this fact-finding tour, uh, I believe promoted by the South African government. Uh, so this is the kind of propaganda that was being uh, put forward in the media at the time. So, uh, so they argued that boycott supporters were not opposed to apartheid as a policy, but they, that they were against South Africa itself as a society, and that ending apartheid would lead to ethnic cleansing of the white population, to bloodbath and destruction. And then for proof, they would turn to neighboring countries and then argue that democracy didn't work in Africa, so it will not work in South Africa. 
And here I want to show an image. Uh, so this is a comic. This is from a comic from 1985 or 86 that was distributed by a few different organizations in Canada. Um, the overall comic is titled uh, Who's Behind the South African Crisis? And in this image, you see the Soviet encirclement of South Africa. You see uh, South Africa with a Soviet bear coming down from the north upon these frightened industries saying, we shall drive South Africa into the sea. So these warnings really were quite apocalyptic, quite, um, uh, quite existential. In some cases, they would even argue that criticism of South Africa was motivated by anti-white racism or by white guilt. And overall, what these complaints amount to are really accusations that uh, the criticism faced by South Africa uh, was fundamentally unfair. And if you follow the debate over BDS closely, you'll likely be quite familiar with a lot of these complaints as they are nearly identical to common arguments from supporters of Israel today. In fact, many of them have been codified into the so-called 3Ds of anti-Semitism um, and the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, which are supposed to prove when criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, but if you use the same standards against uh, criticism of South Africa at the time, I think you find that they would apply. So there's clearly something wrong with these standards. Um, and the difference is that, of course, nobody took these complaints very seriously, except for a small minority at the time. Now, all of this is quite similar to the current Israeli war against BDS, but there is an important distinction in how these wars have played out in Canada and the effect that they've had on boycott movements. So I wanna to touch on that for a second. So um, I talked to a number of anti-apartheid activists as part of my uh, doctoral research, and all of them really downplayed the impact of South African lobbying, um, the impact that that had on their own work. And in many cases, they don't even really remember the opposition at all. So activists obviously had to counter the misinformation that was coming from the pro-South African lobby, but it didn't really impact their ability to organize or to take initiatives in support of the boycott. The exception, of course, is some of the more radical anti-apartheid groups who are subject to surveillance and infiltration, um, as Joanne talked about from her own experience, and sometimes spies by private companies themselves who were targets of boycotts. Um, so some of them uh, maybe had some of these security concerns. And then when it came to members of liberation movements themselves, they had good reason to be very worried about the South African government, which posed a real threat to their very lives. Um, however, for ordinary boycott supporters and local activists, um, I'm sure many of the kinds of people who are on this call right now, um, they were rarely, if ever, directly targeted by South Africa or the South Africa lobby. So this is a massive departure from the Israel case, because today the Israel government and many pro-Israel organizations have an explicit strategy of putting a so-called price tag on activism, of making boycott supporters face negative repercussions for their opinions. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the smear campaigns, as well as efforts to shut down or ban campus groups, uh, legislation to ban or criminalize BDS activism. That's particularly a problem in the US, but there have been attempts in Canada as well. And pretty much all of the BDS activists I spoke to today have personal examples of pro-Israel pro groups who are trying to prevent them from organizing, of trying to intimidate them, or of trying to destroy their reputation. Uh, and many stories of student activists saying that their friends are afraid to get involved because they don't want to be a target. There is simply no precedent for this in the South African experience. There was certainly fierce debate and extensive lobbying, but the South Africa lobby never posed a threat to the very right of Canadians to boycott South Africa. Israel's war on boycott, therefore, is far more repressive in its strategy when it comes to dealing with ordinary boycott supporters. Um, if we have time, there's another distinction I guess I, I'd like to make uh, between the two cases, which is in the character of the institutions of each lobby. Um, because the main Canadian groups that supported South Africa were basically corporate interest groups um, or Friends of South Africa type groups, which were created for the sole purpose of defending that country. Um, but today, the backlash of BDS in Canada is led by Jewish communal organizations, for the most part. So you have Jewish advocacy and pro-Israel advocacy conflated within the same organizations. And since pro-Israel lobby groups have a simultaneous claim to represent Jewish constituents, this gives their arguments a tremendous moral authority and influence in society, which the Friends of South Africa group, groups just never had. They just never had that legitimacy. And this makes it much easier to convince people that BDS and Palestine organizing in general should be understood in terms of anti-Semitism. 
And this poses all sorts of obstacles for the BDS movement um, that the anti-apartheid movement never had to deal with. Questions of strategy, um, message discipline, and all sorts of things, which, um, so while these movements are quite parallel, there are quite a lot of distinctions, I think in many ways the, the BDS movement is, has uh, significant obstacles and setbacks that it has to wrestle with that the anti-apartheid movement never did. And I think um, with that, I'll end my talk and we can go into Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much, Michael. Um, as Michael was speaking, I just posted uh, his Twitter handle in the chat. So again, uh, if people want to follow him, it's there. Thank you so much again to um, both of our speakers, uh, Michael and Joanne. Uh, so we're gonna move now to uh, the Q&A part of this webinar. And of course, uh, your questions can be directed either at uh, Michael or at uh, Joanne. And there's two ways you can ask questions. If you wanna ask your question uh, kind of live on the mic, as it were, you can click the raise your hand feature at the bottom of your screen. That way I'll see your hand is raised. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll call you by name and then uh, I'll unmute your mic so you can ask your question to the speakers. Or if you prefer, you can type a question into the Q&A box uh, and, then, um, and then I'll just read out your question there. So uh, both those ways are fine. Um, let's see. Okay, so we have, uh, we, have one, uh, we have one question already from Sylvia. So I'll just read this question. Um, so the question is, the rhetoric applied by South Africa is almost identical to that applied by Israel. But the difference is how the public receives this message. All over the world, it seems that people accept Israel's lies and misinformation. How can this misinformation be countered? Um, if I could, I guess, jump into that. I think, as I was saying sort of at the end of my presentation, I think a large reason why the complaints um, of sort of double standards of being singled out, why those maybe are, they have more credibility in the eyes of the public, or you know, they're more persuasive than they were in the South Africa case is, is again largely because of um, the fact that the pro-Israel groups do have a, sort of a, a Jewish representational aspect, which means that it's not just coming from friends of South Africa or, or friends of Israel group, but it's coming from uh, you know, the Jewish community in a way. And so I think that gives it more of a legitimacy um, that the South Africa groups never had. And at the same time, it, it might resonate because there is anti-Semitism in society and it is very prevalent. And so there is maybe more, um, it just seems more plausible that this could be the case. Um, but if you look down at many of these arguments, what they're really saying is that uh, this criticism of this country is not something that we see applied to other groups. And I just don't think that's the case. Most of the time we see that actually um, Israel gets special treatment, gets more uh, diplomatic support, gets more uh, uh, funding from the US government, gets more uh, cover for many of its human rights abuses that other countries don't have. And so it's actually kind of reversed. But I think, it, I think because it's sort of, it takes on this uh, religious character almost, or the debate is just so different uh, than it was in the South Africa case, that it, it becomes harder to, 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 to break up down those arguments and look at them for what they are. Okay. No. Wonderful, thank you. Oh I, yeah, go ahead, Joanne. I just wanted to briefly add to that. Um, I think we do have to remember there was a Holocaust um, and in the Jewish community, um, it is remembered uh, with good reason. We don't want to forget what did happen to the Jewish community. So there's that legitimate side. The other more maybe sociological side is that more and more uh, people in the Jewish community today are not religious. And yet they feel Jewish and they want to connect to something that identifies them with that bigger Jewish community. And um, Zionism has been that thing that connects them. So there's those two aspects that I think have to be considered as well. Thank you for that, Joanne. So uh, yeah, we are seeing some questions come in uh, via text in the uh, Q&A box. So we would invite again people to put their questions in there. Or if you wanna ask your question on a mic, just click the raise your hand uh, function and, and you can ask it that way. So our next question 
that we got via text is from Elizabeth. So I'll read that out to, to our panelists. It says, I don't think there was a pro South Africa part of the population uh, at all comparable to Zionist Jews. Am I wrong? And then just in addition, uh, she asked Omar Harami in another Zoom meeting whether if Israel annexed the West Bank, the Palestinians living there would become Israeli citizens and able to vote. He said, no, Israel would annex the land without the people. How can they do that? Um, so yeah, I'll leave that question to either of you who want to answer that. Go ahead, Michael. Well, yeah, there's, it's definitely true uh, that the, um, there, there was far less of an audience for pro-South Africa talking points. That doesn't mean it didn't exist. There was a lot of, um, especially like on the on conservatives and, and on the right, uh, South Africa was definitely um, something that people identified with or wanted to defend in the context of uh, anti-communism and in the Cold War in general. It, uh, South Africa was seen as on the West uh, as an ally in the region. And so there were certainly people from an ideological perspective who, you know, even if they didn't like apartheid, they, uh, South Africa itself was worth defending against these global existential threats. Um, and there's many other reasons people might have supported uh, South Africa, sort of the history um, as a dominion within the British Empire, like Canada was, the history of uh, Canada fighting in the, the Boer War in, in South Africa, all sorts of reasons that would be connections, but, but no significant um, but, but not to a really significant extent. And even though there were many South Africans in Canada, I, it wasn't the, the like white South African uh, immigrants to Canada, it wasn't really an organized uh, demographic block. And many people didn't want to, um, to, to be associated with pro-South Africa lobbying. And many people left South Africa precisely because they didn't agree with apartheid. And so, um, so it is quite different than in the current case you have, obviously with Israel, you have uh, large, again, Jewish representative organizations. So you have religious groups who are um, um, of the biggest proponents of support for the country. And again, that wasn't the case previously. So, so again, the, the whole debate be, takes on this religious character that, uh, that it didn't have in the South Africa case. Go ahead, Joanne. Um, I would disagree a little. I don't think the religious is one part, but anyway, we'll leave that debate for another time. It did spark me to, um, if I can just read, because it's horrible and humorous at the same time from, from the um, article, the piece we wrote in the 80s um, of two progressive conservative members of parliament and what they said in defense of the South African regime. We have Robert Coates, who was a president for the uh, candidate for national president of the PCs, in the papers said he he uh, went to the Transkei um, and called the Black Homeland Program of South Africa the most refreshing experiment in Black Africa today. And the wonderful member of parliament, John Crosby, who when challenged in the House of Commons on a statement sympathetic to the apartheid system replied, I have gone there and seen you big loud mouth. Have you been there? You keep your mouth shut till you go and learn you professional bleeding heart. That's from a member of the Progressive Conservative Party. So there was that going on as well. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. So we're getting a lot of great questions coming in uh, in the Q&A chat box. So I would encourage people to uh, send your questions that way. Also, you know, don't be shy if you want to ask your question on the mic. Again, you can use that raise hand function and uh, we'll try to get to some, uh, some questions live too. It's, it's another way to... I, feel a bit more of your presence as an audience uh, joining us from home. Oh, and I just saw some hands go up. That's great. So we will get to those, but I do have another question by text. Um, so this is uh, an anonymous person who asked this. Uh, just how much has the BDS movement hurt Israel financially? And linked to that, I believe it's the same person who wrote, uh, my recollection is that sports bans and high profile cultural boycotts gain the higher profile in South Africa. Um, so yeah, the question being, how much has the BDS movement hurt Israel financially? And I'll leave that to either of you to ask, uh, to answer that. I think it's hard to tell sort of at a macro level. I think you can maybe point to specific cases where 
Um, maybe there was a uh, like product in the settlements that you could put quite a bit of pressure on and it'd be easy for them to escape that pressure by simply moving down the roads um, inside the green line and therefore not be subject to a boycott. And so in some ways there are some easy targets, maybe like Soda Stream, for example. Um, but as a whole, whether, you know, whether there's an overall uh, financial impact, I don't think that's the case. Um, but it wasn't really the case with South Africa either. Fundamentally, the, the importance of the BDS movement was as a political and educational force. Um, it did create a constituency for sanctions down the road. It's still debatable whether sanctions themselves ended apartheid or had a, a more than nominal uh, effect. But uh, at the very least, boycotts and divestment were important for, for people to uh, develop sort of a political consciousness and to put pressure on their politicians to take uh, government action. And so, um, I, and yeah, sports were also uh, really important because they were very visible, very symbolic. Um, and they, the people that they hurt the most, obviously, were the people who are most benefiting from the system of apartheid. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of benefits to that, but I guess that's sort of a big conversation I don't necessarily wanna go too much into, but um, yeah, so BDS has, I think, a really important role uh, as a political force, more, more important than any financial impact that, that we could imagine. Okay. Uh, we're going to go now to a question from the audience. Um, so this next question is from Harold, and uh, he'll be asking this question on mic. So uh, Harold, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I apologize. I'm sitting outside, so there might be a bit of background noise. Um, my question is primarily to Joanna. Um, who made mention of the Holocaust and how we have to remember that and be mindful of that. And I wonder if, if she's got suggestions or ideas on how to work around that, because I feel that the pro-Israel uh, proponents have deeply politicized that and are weaponizing it as a way to silence critics of Israel. And while, yes, it's important to remember that, I, I just curious what her thoughts are on how we can either depoliticize it or work around um, the, the guilt that, uh, that uh, the Holocaust is used to inflict on uh, supporters of the Palestinian cause. Gosh, that's a big question with a long answer that I can't give <laughs> here. Um, I think I know Harold through Independent Jewish Voices. There, there are some, um, um, older comrades, I'll call them, people who are in or supporters of IJB, who lived through the Holocaust and uh, are still here or had family, and they have been very important in, in helping us appreciate uh, how our struggle has to, you know, be critical of what's going on in Israel today. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's a fine line for all of us in the Jewish community to be both empathetic to those who, who can't let go of this because of the history, and yet to say it's time to move beyond that and to appreciate what Israel, uh, to, to be, um, open your eyes and see what's going on in Israel and what we are doing now to others, um, like somewhat like what was done to us. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, so we have a question here. It's a typed question from Samantha. So it's uh, two questions. So I'll read them. Uh, number one is, how do you stand up to universities that have decided to side with pro-Israel lobby groups? And two, uh, how do you reason with Jewish students at universities, uh, as in those who came from Zionist backgrounds and are taught to combat anyone who criticizes Israel? These are big Michael? <laughs> I think those are questions that are too big for me today. Um, but I do think, I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, it, to a certain extent, it just comes to education and to continue to do that educational work. Um, because if, um, yeah, the, the, it's, you know, it's, it's counter hegemonic. It's, it, it's against the, the stream to support Palestinian rights. Uh, especially um, on campus everywhere. And so I think 
uh, just continuing to do that and to, to putting first always that the reason why people do this work is because it's a call from the Palestinian Palestinian people themselves, and it's a call for freedom and for equality and for asking us to do uh, what we can, what's in our power to further their their own uh, struggle for freedom for everyone. So I, I think emphasizing those aspects um, can, can maybe help to counter sort of the idea, which is a very prominent idea, that the reason that people um, support BDS is because they hate uh, Jewish students on campus, or there's some other sort of cynical um, reason behind it when um, those of us who are doing work know uh, how and why we got involved and it's always because of learning about it, injustice and finding a way that we can participate in in, um, in challenging it. So I think I we just got to keep doing that I guess. And if I can that last sentence was my perfect lead into what I wanted to say which is we just have to keep at it. Um, sometimes uh, these campus uh, protests you seem very small there's a small only a small group of people um, people have many have forgotten that when we were starting the anti-apartheid movement in the 70s um, I remember and I'm sure many of you listening might remember this uh, we would be protesting and there'd be seven of us eight of us you know standing uh, three of us in front of a liquor store people would say apartheid wine I've never heard of that country what is apartheid where's that um, we didn't think I, well, I was cynical. I didn't think we'd win that struggle. You just keep at it and people do change. Actually, on there's one other thing I'd like to say about um, university administrators. I think it is worth noting um, a couple of things. One, that there was a period maybe 10 years ago when universities in Canada were more repressive when it came to BDS and Palestinian activism, where they were um, banning uh, SIA or BDS groups, where they were taking down posters of Israeli Apartheid Week, um, all sorts of things. And I do think we've sort of moved out of that, at least for now. Maybe there will be another sort of wave of that in the future. But there was sort of a really big um, sort of backlash to Palestine organizing right after the start of BDS and Israeli Apartheid Week. And I do think that universities are taking more of a hands-off um, approach to that lately. So I think that is encouraging. It's also maybe worth noting that the backlash that took place on campuses predates the arrival of BDS um, by a number of years going especially to uh, the Second Intifada and that the, the Palestinian or organizing that took place um, in the early 2000s, uh, protests against uh, Netanyahu speaking at, I think it was Concordia, and a few other sort of key events were moments when there was a lot of pressure to, for on universities to clamp down and introduce all of these repressive new bureaucratic uh, policies. Um, and that was before there was even any talk of a boycott. And so in a, in a way, um, I think it's helpful to think of a, an, a bit of a longer view beyond BDS when we're talking about what's happening on campuses, but it has gotten a little bit less repressive, at least in that one space, I think. Wonderful, okay, we'll get to another question now from our audience. Uh, so this question comes from Richard. So Richard, uh, you can go ahead, um, oops, sorry, let's see. Richard, I think you just need to unmute yourself to ask your question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I, I'm curious why this is so limited. Um, we, we talked about Holocaust, um, World War II. Um, it started long before that. Uh, Israel was created back in 1917 uh, in, when Britain and uh, France under the sykes pickard Agreement, overrode the whole, entire Middle East, and uh, the, Roth, the Rothschilds were granted Israel inside Palestine. Um, World War II, uh, the Holocaust was unfortunate and a disaster, uh, but the, the context of the conversation always focuses only on 6 million when Russia lost 27 million. Uh, so Richard, I'm going to ask you to get to your question, please. Why do we not include uh, what's going on to further this thing? Not only you, you claim uh, Jewish communities, but 
the whole uh, evangelical movement is a major thrust behind the United States supporting Donald Trump um, and their belief that... Richard, can you ask your question, please? <sighs> Why don't we get to the point in that uh, Russia is, or uh, Israel is an apartheid state supported by uh, the United States, the evangelical and Zionist movement, and why aren't we more forceful in, in bringing up and raising that voice? Okay, thank you, Richard. I think he just gave a good statement. I don't know that, I don't know the answer. Michael, do you have an answer? An easy I'm not, answer? I'm not entirely sure I understood the question, but there was um, something I do want to pick up on, which is the fact that in, um, in Canada, it is the most, uh, like the pro, most prominent pro-Israel groups are ones that um, also represent uh, Jewish Canadians. But in the US, that's, it's not necessarily true. And uh, in the US, uh, evangelical Zionists um, are very, very powerful as a political force and very, very influential in, in shaping behavior. And so it is a little bit different um, of uh, the, things are a little bit different in terms of how the debate takes place. But it, uh, so I did want to raise that, that that's a really important political force. In Canada, though, Christian Zionists are not as, um, they're, they're around, but they're not as visible. They're not as visible as proponents of Israel, um, but they are working um, in their own church networks to, to build support among their constituencies. Um, and that I'm sure is behind much of the conservative party support for Israel as well. And so, I didn't want to touch on that, but I, I'm not sure if I understood the broader question. Okay, we have another question right now uh, that's come in on text. And again, I'll, I'll just keep reminding people just in case you're just joining us, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can type your questions into the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand if you want to ask your question on the mic and uh, we'll get to your question either way. Uh, so our next question is an advice question, which I always like these. Uh, what advice do you have for people who want to establish local community and university BDS groups? That question comes from Terry. Well, I'll start to say, just keep at it. As I said, in retrospect, when I think of how small our group was uh, and my, in my, cynicism, I never thought anything would come of it, and it did. And so you just um, keep on struggling. And uh, you also, you have confidence that you are on the morally right side and that you're doing, the, you're fighting for justice. <laughs> and um, hopefully more and more people will eventually listen to it and come your way. Uh, there has been movement in the Jewish community across uh, ca across Canada. I think more people may may not be on our side, but are starting to listen. Uh, they're listening, maybe a little more. So that's what you do. You just keep at it. Yeah, I think that's good. I think uh, seeking out advice um, or support and resources from groups that have been doing it for a very long time, like IJV like um, uh, students against Israeli apartheid groups or students for um, human rights. Uh, all, there's all sorts of different uh, groups on campuses across the country and internationally that all, many of them provide resources for how to start doing that kind of work. And I, I like the point that, um, that, yeah, you don't need a, a large group of people uh, to have an impact on campus and to, to start that, ro that role of education work. And, and um, solidarity work. So I think not to get too discouraged by how uh, things look right now, because um, yeah, the, the South Africa movement, I mean, let's remember that the call to boycott South Africa started in 1959. It's almost 30 years later before there were any international sanctions mm -hmm. by uh, Western governments. So um, it, it can take a very long time uh, to do that work. Thank you. And I would also just add, uh, you know, another really important thing, and it's something that we are always working on with IJV is, is to take leadership from Palestinians and Palestinian organizations. That's really, really crucial when you're setting up local uh, BDS chapters. Of course, the BDS movement has been so clearly outlined by the, the BDS 
national organizing committee in Palestine. Um, and it's a really easy campaign to plug into. And I would say beyond that, and this is just a little plug for our next webinar, which is next Sunday, uh, you know, for those of us living um, on indigenous land here on, in Turtle Island or so-called North America, it's really important as well to take leadership uh, from indigenous people who, who steward these lands and stand up to protect these lands. And so again, I would just like to remind people that the next Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we have a fantastic webinar called um, With Suetan Strong, Resisting a Pipeline During a Pandemic with Jennifer Wickham, who is a Wet'suwet'en land defender, who's gonna be you know, talking, you know, we talk a lot about anti-colonial struggles in South Africa and in Palestine. Sometimes it's easy to forget that those anti-colonial struggles are, are happening right here where we live. So that'll be a great webinar to, uh, to learn about that. So, uh, and again, people can register for that at ijvcanada.org slash spring webinars. I'll post the link again uh, in the chat box. The next question is from Cynthia and it's directed to Michael. So Cynthia asks, uh, I would love to know more about Michael's research process. What kind of sources were most important in making a research design process, oral history, archives, national security records? That's a good question. I'll only touch on that because it could get into a big discussion. Um, when I was looking into the pro-South Africa lobby, I had to rely on a number of sources, uh, including extensive archives. So I did archival work. I looked to the African National Congress's archives. They had a Canada mission in Canada and units across the country and all of their archives are in South Africa. So I went through those. Um, I went through, I found archives, uh, uh, files from people who are directors of the Canadian South African society. So um, the, the minutes back and forth. So you can get all sorts of interesting insight into internal debates. Um, but I also relied quite a bit on, on interviews and in the Israel case, uh, relied quite a bit on on just re reporting um, uh, news and lots of interviews. Um, obviously, archives are less helpful in that case. But um, if someone was more interested in that, then I think they could email me and maybe, maybe I can help them more directly that way. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next question comes from Diane. And uh, again, this is a nice kind of strategic question. I love these when we are able to come together and, and talk about strategy. So she asks, uh, what is a specific direction you recommend we all take that you feel would be effective? I guess that can be to either Joanne or to Michael. What, a specific direction with regard to what how to, how to continue this the yes uh so she didn't uh she didn't specify but maybe you know given the fact that of course there's still you know struggles uh in south africa um maybe we can look specifically today at, at, at what's happening uh in palestine and you know how bds relates to our work and um yeah the, the question again is what specific direction do you recommend uh, we all take that you feel would be effective. It's, it's, it's a bit of a wide question. Thank okay. you for that well, question. I'm Diane. just going to answer by saying as an active, a long time activist, I think that's a collective decision that every organization has to take on the ground, um, depending on two things. One is where you're located, because across Canada, there are quite different struggles, depending on where, where you, where you are and your, your, um, your history and your numbers, and and that will change. And so it's why you have to keep uh, reassessing how the struggle. And of course, I, I have to throw in now with all the COVID nineteen things going on, many of the actions uh, and meetings and so on we would have had have come to a halt. So we have to now rethink a lot of things over the next little while about how our struggle will continue. I feel like um, doing my doctoral work, I've been looking a lot at the past and I don't feel that equipped at talking about what we should do in the future. Um, uh, maybe Aaron, uh, I could ask if you have any ideas of what uh, IJV is thinking, but I do want to highlight that the talks um, in Israel around annexation uh, are likely to shake things up a bit in terms of how activism takes place and the kinds of actions and um, and who is sympathetic and how uh, that kind of thing. There's so many questions that it raises if the government does decide to annex most of the West Bank um, in a few months as it is promising uh, to do. And as Trump said, is fine 
uh, and good for them to do. So I think we're going to have to think about how, as that changes things on the ground, will we have new allies? Will there be new uh, friends? Are there different kinds of actions we can take? So um, lots of things to, to think about. Yeah. And I, I would just add, you know, as IJV, um, you know, we were the first national Jewish organization in Canada to endorse the BDS movement. It's something that we're, we're very proud of. And so we've been working on this campaign for the better part of the last decade. Uh, one of our main campaigns that we're working on today is with regards to the IHRA. So that's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Uh, and they put out this redefinition of anti-Semitism that is quite dangerous because it is explicitly conflating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Uh, and they're trying to get it past it different levels of government, federal, provincial, municipal. We've had a lot of success already in Canada um, in terms of fighting this and stopping it uh, at a municipal level. Um, but of course, th there's big battles ahead of us. There's a battle in Ontario right now that is of course on, on pause because of uh, the COVID crisis. Um, but but that, that is a really important thing in, in terms of protecting public discourse and protecting free speech around Palestine. Uh, and so I would invite uh, anyone to, who's curious about that campaign, uh, they can either go on our website, ijvcanada.org, or we actually have a specific website with regards to that fight. It's noihra.ca. That's noihra.ca. Uh, we have time maybe for one or two more questions. So again, if you want to ask a question on the mic, now would be the time to click the raise your hand uh, feature. Otherwise, I've got a great typed question here. And I, I do have to apologize. We have so many good questions. We won't have time to get to all of them. Uh, if you want, if you have a burning question that you really want to follow up with us, I would invite you as well to email us, uh, info at ijvcanada.org. Uh, but this question comes from Avram, and he asks, what was key to ending the apartheid regime in South Africa? And what lessons, if any, does that provide for today's BDS movement? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, what was key? I've got Neil here with me. Um, well, certainly Nelson Mandela's uh -huh. release uh, in my memory was so transformative. Uh, I still I remember the TV on watching him walk out and tears just rolling down my eyes because I never thought it would happen. And I think for a lot of us, it was a turning point and we felt that um, things could change. Things we didn't think could change could change. And I think we in more current movements have to keep that memory alive that we think things may never change, but sometimes they do. And uh, it's just hard to know. The side <laughs> Sorry. It's just hard to know what that event would be in the relationship of Israel-Palestine right now, like what kind of a transformative event could take place that would shift the, shift the, uh, the momentum towards uh, peace and justice for Palestinians. I don't know. I wish I could think of what that might be. But um, let's be, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Donald Trump will Maybe. get defeated or something. Yeah, I don't something know. Like that. One thing I'll say is that um, uh, the sanctions that were put upon South Africa um, did seem somewhat effective, but they happened in a moment in which South Africa was going through an economic collapse, essentially, and uh, the sanctions made it worse and made it harder for them to deal with it. But uh, you couldn't really necessarily say that sanctions like ended apartheid. I'm not sure you could put it on any one thing. The, the ANC was involved in a guerrilla war for decades. You had um, wars in the frontline states. You have all sorts of things, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which means no support from, uh, for the ANC, um, all sorts of, uh, of the whole Cold War paradigm. So, I mean, it's hard to put the point on just one thing. There's a whole historical conjuncture. Um, I think we just, um, what we need to do is continue to do the work and be very prepared and um, following the lead of, of Palestinian civil society so that when there is a moment, an event that comes up which provides an opportunity to put pressure on governments to act, that we are ready to put that pressure and to, and to intervene in history in that way. So that's a big task, but we just need to be uh, ready for that. 
And if I can just add, as you're, as you're talking, Michael, none of us know what the COVID-19 situation is going to do for any global situation in the world, to be blunt about it. We simply don't know how all of this will play out. So we just have to keep paying attention and watching and be, being ready to act if we have to. Indeed, being ready is always key. I think we're going to have to leave it there, uh, unfortunately, today. Um, again, I want to thank both of our speakers for all of your insights and sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, Joanne Nyman, who is joining us today from Vancouver, and Michael Buchert, who is joining us from Ottawa. Thank you so much to everyone who was joining this webinar, either on Zoom or on, uh, on our Facebook page. We are streaming as well. Um, on Facebook Live. Uh, so again, I do really want to encourage, uh, last couple of things, uh, I, I really want to encourage people to join our webinar next Sunday, uh, Witsuitan Strong, Resisting a Pipeline During a Pandemic. I just posted the link where you can register for that webinar uh, in the chat. It's ijvcanada.org slash spring webinars. And of course, if you're able to, um, it, it's always very, very helpful if you can donate to IJV. It helps us continue to bring you webinars like this. So you can go to our website, ijvcanada.org, and then click the green donate button uh, at the top right of the page. Uh, so thank you again, Joanne and Michael. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone out there. So hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. We wish you all the best in health, strength, and solidarity. Until next time. Oh, that's the end.